Hey everyone, how's it going? So yes, I've been gone again for a while and I'm sure you guys have questions and I'll answer them at the end, but right now I'm just really excited to make another video. And this is a video that I've wanted to make for years and didn't even know that I wanted to make it because this game is pretty new. But if you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll know I like two things a lot about Pokemon. I really like Generation 1 and I really like catching them all. And wouldn't you know, there would be a game that just, well, not just, because it's been a while, but has been released recently that combines both of those things, and so I thought it would be really fun to continue my long-running catch em all series by trying to do a catch em all for Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. Now, these games, if you don't really know much about them, they're interesting in that they are pretty much, in some ways, a straight-up remake of Generation 1, specifically Pokemon Yellow, so they're really trying to appeal to those fans who played Red and Blue and maybe haven't played many games since, which is similar to what Pokemon Go tried to do, and obviously this game is trying to cash in a little bit on Pokemon Go's success, hence the name Pokemon Let's Go. And in some ways, as a remake of Generation 1, it is very much like all the other Pokemon RPG games that you know and love, specifically Red and Blue, I mean the objectives are the same, you catch Pokemon, you beat gym leaders, you try and beat the Elite Four, the locations are all the same, the plot is the same. So to that end, if you've played Red and Blue, you shouldn't have too much trouble with these games. However, there are some pretty big changes, both between these games and their Gen 1 counterparts, and between these games and the rest of the Pokemon series as a whole, and these changes are going to affect a catch em all pretty dramatically, which is why, before I start talking about what Pokemon we can and can't catch, we should be talking about what changes are made to Pokemon Let's Go. So the first change I want to talk about is a change that really does affect the way this game plays. Because ever since Red and Blue came out like 20-something years ago, the way you encountered a Pokemon has been the exact same thing. Essentially, you ran around in the grass or cave or whatever, and at some point, randomly, a Pokemon would appear from the Pokemon that are available on that given route. Now, I realized there were other ways of getting Pokemon. There was fishing, which you can do on demand, but it's still a random encounter. And of course, there's the legendary Pokemon that you go up and talk to, but you can only usually catch just one of them. And I know that over the years, there have been some supplemental mechanics that have been introduced. Some examples are the Poke Radar, which has appeared in Generation 4 and Generation 6. Also in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, we have the Dex Nav, which I really, really like. However, most of the time, the way you encountered Pokemon was by running around the grass and randomly encountering them. That is no longer the case in Let's Go. In Let's Go, there are no random encounters. None whatsoever. You just walk up to Pokemon, which spawn in the overworld, and there you go. It's really, really easy. And especially for common Pokemon, it seems to save a lot of time. Back in, well, every game, you wanted a common Pokemon and your only choice to find one was to run around the grass. And even if it was a 30% encounter rate, maybe it would take you three to four encounters. Not anymore. Now, you want that Caterpie in Viridian Forest? Just, instead of having to run around, look for one. Oh, there it is. And bam, an encounter. As someone who has done quite a few catch em alls, this was a very welcome change. I cannot, well, I don't actually know how much time it saved me overall because I wasn't really rushing, but it was still way less frustrating to have a Pokemon that should appear 30% of the time just be able to walk up to it rather than running around and maybe having to go through 10 encounters, which does happen from time to time. However, there was a point at which I started to wonder if overall, random encounters weren't actually quicker for catching Pokemon. And let me explain. I was looking for Pinsir, and if you're playing Let's Go Pikachu, this would apply to Scyther. Now, these Pokemon are only available in this game on routes 14 and 15, and only 1% of the time. Now, if you haven't memorized the Pokemon map by now, what are you doing on my channel? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, Route 15 is that route just to the right of Fuchsia City. And if you take a look, there isn't a lot of grass here. Now, for random encounters, this doesn't really matter because you can still run around in grass no matter what size. But the amount of Pokemon that spawn from the grass are determined by how big the grass is, which is why you see a ton of Pokemon in Viridian Forest, 
but not as many on Route 15. So I decided to look for pincer on Route 14, which has this larger patch of grass, and usually could get about three Pokemon to spawn at a time if I wasn't using a lure. And to get a pincer to appear took me a really long time, like over an hour. And it was really tedious. I mean, think about it. I'm just sort of sitting around waiting, sometimes running around in circles, hoping that the next Pokemon that spawns is Pinsir, and it kept not being Pinsir. And I started to wonder whether or not it would not have been just quicker if I was running around the grass, getting an encounter, running away, and rinsing and repeating, which is what I was used to doing. So I thought of just leaving that as a question in this video, because that's what a normal person would do, but unfortunately, I'm a little bit insane, so I decided to actually test whether or not the random encounter method or this new method was quicker in terms of getting as many encounters as you can as quick as possible. So I decided to make my test as scientific as I possibly could. For all the games where Route 14 was an option, I would go to Route 14, I always led with Kadabra, and all I did was I took out my bicycle and I went in circles and I would encounter Pokemon and run away and do this until I encountered 20 different Pokemon and I would just time it and see how long it took. I then went to Route 14 in Let's Go and simply waited for 20 Pokemon to appear. So the idea is how quick is it to see 20 different Pokemon because that raises the odds that one of them would be a pincer, for example. And uh, here are the results. They uh, do not support my gut feeling. It is much quicker to do this in Let's Go. I mean, compared to Sun and Moon, it's almost twice as quick. Compared to Red and Blue, it's quicker. And compared to Diamond and Pearl, which is where I did my last catch em all, it's about 50% quicker the new method. And that was without using a lure. If I used a lure, it probably would have taken even less time. So it's why it's good to test these things. I think the reason it felt like it was taking longer is because when you run around and encounter Pokemon the old way, I guess it felt to me like I was doing something, so the time passed quicker. Well here, you're very aware that you're just standing around doing nothing. Sometimes I would twirl around because I think the amount of steps you take will impact how quick Pokemon spawn and despawn. I haven't found any concrete information on that yet, but at the end of the day, new method quicker for a catch em all new method, in my opinion, better. With that said, not all the changes made to the catching experience in this game were quite as well received, especially by me. And the next change we're going to talk about is what happens after you encounter the Pokemon. You see, after you encounter the Pokemon, what's always happened is you're in a battle, similar to a trainer battle, but you try and weaken the Pokemon to as low health as possible, probably give it a status, and then use whatever Pokeball you can that will give you the greatest odds of catching it. Now, it's not like this was the best part of Pokemon or anything. I mean, at the end of the day, it kind of felt almost like doing a math equation. In fact, I'd even use this calculator very often to try and optimize how to catch Pokemon as quick as possible since I had to catch a bunch of them, but it was never something I viewed negatively. Let's go on the other hand, I'm not so neutral about. You see, rather than engaging the Pokemon in a battle, those don't really exist. I mean, there's a couple times you engage wild Pokemon in battles, but that is just to preempt this normal situation, which is to try and catch Pokemon similar-ish to Pokemon Go, but using motion controls. And I'm gonna be honest, guys, I think this really sucks. Not a fan of motion controls, and these work okay, but even after I started to get used to them, they're still not amazing. So if you haven't played the game, here's what's essentially going on. All you need to do for the easy encounters is the Pokemon will stay still, and what I found works is you flick your wrist, and this will throw the Pokeball, and the goal is to get the Pokemon in the center of that shrinking circle, and the smaller the circle is when the Pokeball hits, if it hits the center, the bigger bonus you get. So instead of trying to weaken the Pokemon or status it to increase your odds, you're trying to use motion controls to try and get a bullseye, essentially. And unfortunately, it's not always as simple as that. Once you get to Mount Moon, the Pokemon will start moving around a little bit. And this is when you learn the motion controls really aren't that good, because sometimes I would be flicking left, I thought, and yet the Pokeball would go right. 
Now, since I'm not new to this, I realize there's going to be a whole bunch of people telling me how great the motion controls are and how they've never had a problem, and congratulations. I did, I'm just talking about my experience. But one thing I think we can all probably agree on are a couple of other things that just really aren't fun. The first is the fact that Pokemon quote-unquote attack you during this battle. And by attack, I mean they go into this little attack animation and the circle disappears and you can no longer catch the Pokemon. Now, after playing this game long enough, I started being able to predict when this would happen, but it is still essentially random. Plus, Pokemon can also go into this power stance animation, at least that's what I call it, and after they go into this power stance animation, they will run away. Now, for common Pokemon, this is just, I guess, a little irritating, but for rare Pokemon, if this were to happen, which, thank goodness, it never happened to me, I would be furious, because it's just like the Safari Zone. Every catching encounter is just luck now. I mean, you can do all the things. It, for example, towards the end of the game, what I started doing was I used two controllers, got a synchronized double excellent with an ultra ball, having used the raspberry, which makes it easier to catch the Pokemon, and still, this isn't a legendary, mind you, it didn't catch. It's just the way it works. I don't know what the catch rates are, I don't know um, how the equations work, but the fact is, it just feels like there is a lot more luck built into every encounter. So even though now there is actual skill in catching Pokemon, I mean, it's not just a math equation. You have to get good at throwing the Pokeballs and aiming the Pokeballs. Still, the fact you use so many Pokeballs per encounter, and when you actually do catch the Pokemon, to me, it feels like complete luck. I'm not a fan of the new system. However, I will say the fact it is different did make it at least interesting since I've done so many under the old system. Now, one last thing before I get to the part in the video where I actually talk about how many Pokemon you can catch, I do want to talk about the differences between these games and their Gen 1 predecessors. So perhaps the biggest difference that you'll notice is that Pokemon's locations are changed up. Not just in the way they were changed up in Fire Red Leaf Green, where it felt like there were small changes here and there, these are big changes. Like, let's take Route 1, for example. We all know Route 1 has Pidgey and it has Rattata. It's always been that way, right? Wrong. In Let's Go Eevee, Let's Go Pikachu, it has Bellsprout or Oddish, depending on your version. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it definitely confused me. Another thing that gave me a lot of confusion was trying to find Abra. I went to that route above Cerulean City where you've always been able to find Abra and I looked there for 20 minutes but I could never find an Abra. Now ordinarily this wouldn't be a problem for me because before I do a catch em all I look up where to catch every single Pokemon and do a lot of planning but for these games I thought I'd actually try and do it blind since I thought it'd be fun to play the game without looking things up which is something I don't get to do very often plus I mean they're based on generation 1 and I've played Fire Red Leaf Green how different could they be? But they were different enough that I did have to look things up a few times. Plus, there's a couple big mechanics changes. For example, there is no Safari Zone, which is why Pinsir is available in Routes 14 and 15. All the Pokemon available in the Safari Zone in the other games are now available just in the wild. Additionally, there are no in-game trades that give you new Pokemon. The in-game trades are only for Alola Pokemon. And finally, small difference is that there is no fishing in this game. So all the water Pokemon you would catch via fishing are just available via surfing or maybe in the grass. So having covered all the major differences that impacted this catch em all, let's get into the catch em all itself and talk about exactly how many Pokemon I was able to catch in a single playthrough of either Let's Go Eevee or Let's Go Pikachu. All right, so I thought it'd be fun to compare the number we're going to get in Let's Go Pikachu Eevee to the three other numbers we've gotten before. So we have our red and blue chart over here, our yellow chart, and then finally our fire red and leaf green chart. And if you look at the chart closely, although I haven't labeled it as such, you can see there are essentially four categories of Pokemon that prohibit you from getting all 150 in a single playthrough. The first category are the starter Pokemon, the second category are Pokemon that you need to trade. Then you have your choice Pokemon, so Pokemon you can only usually choose or only evolve once, that sort of thing. And then finally, we have our version exclusives. 
Now, the great thing about the Let's Go games is that two of these categories are no longer a problem, which is going to bring that number up. So let's start off by dealing with the first category, the category most people really enjoy being able to catch in a single playthrough, and those are the starter Pokemon. I know when I was a kid, I was really upset I couldn't also get a Charmander and Bulbasaur once I picked my Squirtle. But in Let's Go, that's not a problem, irrespective of how you define starter. So if by starter you're thinking of the Kanto starters, just like in Pokemon Yellow, there are NPCs that, if conditions are met this time around, will give you one of the Kanto starters. So that's pretty great. However, there is a way to get as many Kanto starters as you'd like, pretty much whenever you'd want, using a final new mechanic I didn't mention until right now because it seems pretty relevant. And that mechanic is the catch combo, a mechanic I am a huge fan of and really hope they bring this into every subsequent Pokemon game. Combos are not new to Pokemon. There have been Poke Radar combos, Dex Nav combos, Fishing combos, but the catch combo, in my opinion, is not only the most fun, but is also the most player friendly. And all you really need to do to start a catch combo is catch the same Pokemon over and over again. And unlike the other combos, the game actually tells you what your combo length is. It's displayed on screen. I know, Pokemon giving information, what is that? But it's really, really cool. And in all the other combos, it was really, really easy for your combo to end, even if you tried your very hardest. With catch combos, it is pretty difficult for your combo to end if you don't want it to. So there are only three conditions that I know of where your combo will end. The first is if you catch a Pokemon that is not the one you are comboing. So let's say you are comboing Pidgey. If you catch a Rattata, the combo is over. The second is if you shut off your Nintendo Switch. And finally, perhaps the most frustrating way your combo can end is if a Pokemon runs away from you before you are catching it. So if you are comboing Pidgey and a Pidgey gets into that power stance and then runs away, your combo will end. However, there is a way to stop your combo from ending because note that I said if the Pokemon runs away from you. If you run away from the Pokemon, irrespective of whether it's a Pokemon you are comboing or whether it's any other Pokemon you encounter by accident, the combo continues. Also, if you encounter a Pokemon you're not comboing, so long as you don't catch it, the combo continues. Want to battle a trainer? The combo continues. Ending your combo in this game pretty much is always your fault. I mean, yeah, a couple times you might not notice it went into the power stance or you might confuse it for the attack animation. That's definitely happened to me. But overall, compared to the Poke Radar and other methods, this is really friendly and the rewards are also much better in my opinion. So of course there are these standard combo rewards. The Pokemon you will find have higher and higher IVs and you have a higher chance of finding a shiny as your combo continues. But I'm sure some of you are wondering, what the heck does this have to do with Kanto starters? Well, the reward for getting a catch combo can potentially be that Kanto starters will appear. So you can get these special Pokemon that will appear once you reach combos of a certain length. And the higher your combo is, the more often these Pokemon will appear. And three of the Pokemon that can appear, depending on where you are, are the Kanto starters. So you have two options to get Kanto starters, and even though breeding is not a thing in this game, you can still get as many Kanto starters as you would like. But how about these game starters, Pikachu and Eevee? Surely you can't catch them just like normal, right? Wrong! You can catch both Pikachu and Eevee in both versions. Pikachu is still available in both versions in Viridian Forest just like normal. Also, they made Eevee just a normally catchable Pokemon. No longer do you just get it in Celadon City. Now it's available where Cycling Path used to be. They've completely redesigned the route and you can catch as many Eevee as you'd like, which is a pretty big deal. So to put this all in perspective, let's look back at the graphics from the previous catch em -alls. If everything just stayed the same as red and blue, because we can get all the starters, the number would be 130. But because we can also get all the evolutions, since we can get as many Eevee as we want, that number goes up to 132. That's not too bad. 
Yellow, the number was actually 133 because Raichu and the two evolutions would be catchable. And if nothing else changed and things were like Fire and Leaf Green, the number would be 131. But like I said, there are two categories that aren't a problem. And I think you can see the second category that won't be a problem, judging by the fact we can catch evolutions, is that we don't have to make choices in this game. I mean, technically, you still do have to make a choice. You do have to pick either the Dome or Helix Fossil in Mount Moon, and at the Fighting Dojo, you still have to pick either Hitmonchan or Hitmonlee, but the other Pokémon is still catchable in a single playthrough. The Hitmons are both available on different floors of Victory Road as catch combo rewards, and the other Fossil, while you have to wait till the post-game, is available near these rock formations hidden, in Cerulean Cave, and you actually can get as many fossils as you'd like via this method, but it's not all good news in the Let's Go series. There are still version exclusives, quite a few of them, but this time, for the first time, there are different numbers of version exclusives. So in Let's Go Pikachu, you cannot catch 12 Pokemon, including the Ekans line, the Vulpix line, the Meowth line, the Bellsprout line, the Coughing line, and Pinsir. And in Let's Go Eevee, you can't catch 11 Pokemon, including the Sanshu line, the Oddish line, the Mankey line, Growlithe, the Grimer line, and Scyther. So you might have noticed that our K9 is catchable in both versions, and to catch it, all you need to do is talk to this lady in Vermilion City. Regardless of what you answer, she will make you catch 5 Meowth. Once you do that and speak to her again, you will get an R K9. So this is one of the few times that picking a version is not just a matter of what exclusives you prefer, but if you want to catch more Pokemon in a single playthrough, pick Let's Go Eevee. You will catch one more Pokemon. And of course, there are four Pokemon that will not be catchable, which bring our grand total to 135. And the four Pokemon you cannot catch are, of course, the Pokemon that require a trade in order to evolve. And these Pokemon are Alakazam, Gengar, Golem, and Machamp. Now, you might be wondering why I haven't up to this point talked about any Pokemon that gave me trouble. I've been doing this a lot in my past Catch em All videos, and the reason is, like Red and Blue, there aren't any real weird exceptions. I mean, yeah, there are Pokemon that have 1% encounter rates, but realistically, this is the Catch em All. My goal in these videos are to talk about my Catch em All experience. And to me, that means talking about how the mechanics really changed the experience and talking about how many Pokemon I caught in a single playthrough. But there's nothing like Spiritomb or Feebas or Munchlax. This game is really straightforward, and that made it pretty refreshing, honestly. That being said, there is a major complaint I have. However, this is a complaint that probably just affects me and a small minority of people. But you'll also understand from this complaint how I've done these catch em alls in the past, because catch em alls were not a video idea I invented to get views or anything. This was something I've been doing forever, way before I had a YouTube channel. It was something I did on my own, kind of as a challenge run through Pokemon. I didn't like Nuzlocks or anything like that. The way I wanted to make the game more interesting and more challenging was to try and catch every single Pokemon all by myself and see what combination of games I needed, equipment, etc. And I'd always try and find things pretty cheaply because I didn't have a lot of money to spare. Well, Let's Go makes this really difficult. Because if you want any more than the 135 or 134 Pokemon you can catch in a single playthrough, in my view, is just economically not viable. And there are two reasons for this. Reason number one is that you can't just buy a second Nintendo Switch. I mean, you can. If you're really rich and you have another four or five hundred dollars to spend on a second system you were only going to use for trading in a single spin-off game, then I'm glad you have that kind of disposable income and go ahead. I personally do not. And even if I did, I could not justify the waste of money having a second Switch that would just accumulate dust that I would only use for this purpose. I managed to convince myself for the Game Boy and the DS because they were cheap, but I cannot do that for the Nintendo Switch. Speaking of things you can't do on a Nintendo Switch, my original plan to catch every single Pokemon and then record the diploma, which is always a fun part of the video, was to play through Let's Go Pikachu on my own Switch, get all the Pokemon I needed, then go over to a friend's house with my game and my Switch, and then facilitate a trade. 
However, that's not how saving works. The games do not save to the cartridge. They might look a little like DS cartridges, but they don't work like DS cartridges. They save to the system. So playing through Let's Go Pikachu on my system wouldn't do me any good because I can't trade between two save files on the same system. Now this is a really, really easy fix. Pokemon could easily introduce some sort of app or add-on that would allow you to do this. I think it's simply a matter of how many people really need this. And the answer is probably very few, but for me in this series going forward, I mean, I still have quite a few more generations to cover before we deal with Gen 8, and it hasn't even been announced other than a concept. But I'm sure there'll be Pokebank, but will there be the ability to trade between 3DS and Switch? I doubt it. And so, do I get a second Switch? I don't really want to do that. So I have to really think about how this series is going to work, it is an unfortunate side effect of switching this to console and having the game save on the console with no ability to trade between different save files on the same console. I'm not a fan. But otherwise, I'm going to be honest guys, as the video comes to a close, I like this catch em all. It was a ton of fun. There were things I didn't like. I've talked about two major things I didn't like, but overall I had a ton of fun and that's it for this video. I do plan on posting a little more regularly. I have four day weeks this semester, so that's gonna make it a little easier to post more often, AKA more than once a year. And there's some videos I really, really wanna to get to. Also, because I'm sometimes playing games that aren't Pokemon, not for the channel, I might try and make videos on those because it wouldn't really be taking away from the Pokemon videos. Just sometimes when I wasn't posting, I realized, hey, why don't I just make a video on this? But I was worried, well, it's not Pokemon and that's all you make videos on. So it's something I'm gonna try. If people don't like it, it's something I can maybe do on a second channel or just stop doing altogether. But that's about it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope I see you sooner than 2020. Take care.